All right, let's do this. So we uh, finished up unit two. We're now moving on to unit three. Uh, we're actually going to jump to kind of the last chapter in our textbook here, our transition metal complexes, all right? And then we'll uh, come back to chapter 19 after this, okay? Um, our discussion of transition metals in Chem 1B will be complex. Uh, bad chemistry joke. Um, but there's actually not really any math involved in this particular chapter. So we're going to take a little bit of a math break here for this particular chapter, uh, sort of learn more qualitative information about these transition metal complexes. Okay? So uh, before we can dive in and talk about what the heck a complex is, we've got to take a step back and talk about our transition metals, and in particular the electronic structure of our transition metals, what we call the electron configurations. Okay? So, let me make some room here. First of all, our transition metals, where do they live on the periodic table? That's this middle block right here, okay? Here are our transition metals, okay? Remember, we have our little staircase in our periodic table. Right? Everything that lives on the left are metals. Everything that lives on the right are nonmetals. But the transition metals specifically are right here in the middle. We're not talking about these first two columns of metals here. Okay? All right. So, again, we're going to need to review some stuff talking about electron configurations. So what do I mean by an electron configuration? That's that 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, da 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 stuff. All right, so we're going to review how to do that. Hopefully this is just review from last semester. Okay, but so hydrogen, for example, is 1s1. That is its electron configuration. All right, so I'll tell you how I got that here in a second. You're just going to trust me for now. All right, but again, let's say hydrogen is 1s1, okay? The number out front, this is what we call the principal quantum number. All right, the S corresponds to our orbital shape. And that superscript, the one, corresponds to the number of electrons in that orbital. All right, so just to review, what is an orbital? So. An orbital is like an electron cage. All right, we're talking about the electronic structure of, in this case, a hydrogen atom. Okay, the electrons in that hydrogen atom, they're trapped in what we call orbitals. All right. Um, that's kind of like, again, kind of like think about it as an electron cage here, right? So we have this atom. We know that there's this proton in the middle, and there's this electron that's counterbalancing it. Where does that electron live? It's kind of zipping around that hydrogen atom, but specifically contained within this s orbital, okay? So the s corresponds to the shape of the orbital. We got three different types of orbitals to talk about. An s orbital. Yep, we'll get there. All right, an S orbital has a spherical shape. That's not how you spell spherical. All right, so again, according to my electron configuration here, I have one electron that lives in this S orbital in a hydrogen atom. So that means that if I had a hydrogen atom here in my hand and we hopped into our magic school bus and we shrunk down, we would see that that electron is kind of zipping around that hydrogen atom in this spherical cage, right? In a spherical shape. 
That kind of checks out. That's kind of a pretty normal way to think about an atom is as a sphere. Okay? It turns out, though, that there's even more complicated shapes that electrons can be trapped in as well. Other orbitals. Okay? So the next type of orbital that we're going to learn about is a p orbital. And this has a peanut shape. And that is not at all where the name comes from, but it's just helpful in terms of remembering the shape here. All right? So yes, yeah, some electrons in some atoms are trapped in these spherical orbitals. They're moving around in this sort of spherical cage. Other ones are trapped in peanut shape orbitals. This electron is allowed to move around, but only within this sort of peanut shaped cage here. This is not something that you would just like naturally intuitively think of here. Okay? This stuff comes from deep quantum mechanical calculations. Some pretty complicated math went behind figuring out how electrons move about in an atom. That is the basis of quantum mechanics, something that really wasn't appreciated until like at the earliest the 1920s. So this is fairly recent understanding of the shape of our uh, atoms here. Right? Long, long time ago they just imagined atoms were little marbles. And then the big brains in the physics department came along and were like, actually, things are way more complicated than that. They had to develop a whole new math to figure it out, quantum mechanics. We are not going to do that math here. It's a little bit beyond the scope of our course. It actually uses a completely different algebra than the calculus that you're probably studying at this point. It's kind of a next level up a math situation here. But these orbitals are what come out of that calculation. The idea that our electrons are not just, these aren't just little simple marbles. Our electrons are actually confined in some much more complicated shapes, right? So we got our very logical s orbitals, but also these weird peanut-shaped orbitals, the p orbitals. And then lastly, our third kind are what are called d orbitals. Okay, and these have these kind of four-leaf clover shapes, or easy to remember, daisy shapes to them. All right, so in addition to having different shapes associated with these different orbitals, they also have different capacities, right? They can hold different number of electrons. An s orbital can fit a total of two electrons in it max. That's all it can hold. All right, the p orbitals have a little bit higher of a capacity. They can hold six electrons total. And then lastly, our d electrons can hold a total of, t I'm sorry, our d orbitals can hold a total of 10 electrons. Cool? All right, so again, we look at our electron configuration for hydrogen. This tells us how the electrons are structured in that atom. You have only one electron, because we're talking about a teeny tiny hydrogen atom. And it lives in an s orbital, a spherical shaped orbital. Okay? The principal quantum number, that one out front, this corresponds to the size of the orbital. So one is for the smallest s type orbitals. As you increase in principal quantum number, 2s, 3s, these are still spherically shaped orbitals, but now they're getting bigger and bigger. Okay? All right, so how did I get this? All right, how do I know that hydrogen is 1s1? We can tell the electron configuration for an element by looking at where it lives on the periodic table. So we got to take our periodic table here, and we're going to cut it up. These first two columns here. This is what we call the s block. All of your elements that live in the, la in the uh, s block, their last orbital in their electron configuration will be an s orbital. If we jump to the other side of the periodic table,
This is what we call the P block. All elements that live in the P block, their last orbital in their electron configuration will be a P orbital. All right, and then in the middle are transition metals. They live in what we call the D block. All right, and then the ones at the very bottom here, the super he heavy elements. This is what's called the F block. This is also a shape of an orbital, but we're not going to talk about the F block electrons, uh, or the F block elements, rather. Uh, they tend to be very poorly behaved. All right, they don't really follow the same logic that we're going to lay out here. So we're going to kind of conveniently ignore these elements down at the bottom here, the really heavy ones. Okay? So, in my S block, we got our S block here, right? Those first two columns. We're going to number the rows of our S block. Okay, so this first row here is one, then two, three, four, five, six, seven. Hydrogen is in the first row of my S block, and that's how I know it has the one s orbital okay furthermore it is the first element in the s block and that's how i know it only has one electron in its one s orbital all right so the principal quantum number corresponds to the row all right what row it lives in and the subscript, uh, the superscript rather, the number of electrons in that or orbital corresponds to the column number. It's in that first column of the S block. All right, so there is one element that's kind of out of place here, so we have to correct it. If you notice, I kind of conveniently left helium out of the P block here, okay? Helium kind of lives on the wrong side of the periodic table. We put it over there with the noble gases because it is a noble gas. It does not form bonds with any other element. It's perfectly happy all by itself because it has a full octet of electrons. But helium's kind of weird because it's really teeny tiny. It can only hold two electrons, so actually helium should be right here when we're doing our electron configuration. Okay? So, what is then the electron configuration of helium? It again lives in that one, uh, that first row of the S block, so it's a 1S orbital. But now it's in the second column, so it's 1s2. It's got two electrons in that 1s orbital. All right, now I'm going to go on to neon here. Uh, not neon, I'm sorry, lithium here, right? Element three. Lithium now lives in the second row of the S block, okay? So that tells me that its last orbital in its electron configuration is going to be the 2S orbital. And it lives in that first column, right? So how many electrons are in that 2S orbital? Just one, all right? But the electron configuration for these larger elements they're going to contain the electron configuration of everything that came before it as well. So it's not just a 2s electron. If you think about it, I don't have enough electrons here, right? There are three protons. There's got to be three electrons at the end of the day. So where are those other two electrons? They live in whatever came before that orbital. So in this case, before element three, 
would be that one S block. And so it's going to be a completely full 1s orbital. So the electron configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. Where it lives on the periodic table tells me the last orbital that gets filled, and then I got to do everything that came before it. Okay, so let's do a more complicated one. Let's jump over here to our p block. We're going to do oxygen. All right, but before we can do this one, we got to label the rows of our P block as well, just like we did with our S block. When we number our P block, we're not going to start at 1. We're going to start at 2. So this first row here in my P block is the 2P row. Then 3, 4, 5, and 6. All right, so that means that oxygen, its last orbital that I'm going to fill is a 2p orbital. And oxygen is element 1, 2, 3, 4 in that p block. So there are four electrons living in that 2p orbital. But now I got to include in my electron configuration everything that came before that, right? So I'm going to look at the beginning of my 2p orbital. Five. I got to go what came in before five. So that would be this right here, the 2s orbital. So 2s, and they're going to be completely full at this point. So 2s2. And what comes before 2s? 1s. That next row up, right? This is element three in my 2s block. So going back to element one and two. All right, so given that, everybody take a second and tell me what the electron configuration for chlorine would be. All right, so chlorine lives in the 3p row. So that means my last orbital is going to be a 3p orbital. And it's element 5 in that 3p. So that means there's five electrons, 3p5. But now I got to include everything that came before it, right? So what's in front of the 3p row? That's 13, so I'm going to look for element 12. So that'd be that one right here. All right, so then what comes before that? 3s2. What comes before the 3s? Yes, 2p. So be careful. We're not just going to go up to this next row here. We got to look. What, becomes, uh, what comes before element 11? That would be right here, element 10, right? So I'm back to my 2p row. So 2p, and then it's going to be full. So how many electrons can be in that 2p orbital? Six. What comes before 2p? 2s, again, full. What comes before 2s? The 1s. All right, so as your elements get bigger and bigger and bigger, all you're doing is tacking on more and more and more orbitals to that electron configuration. 
right? Worst case scenario, I ask you for something like at the bottom of the periodic table here. You're going to have this really long electron configuration, OK? And again, what does this configuration correspond to? It turns out that if you're holding a chlorine atom in your hand, two of its electrons would be trapped in a teeny tiny sphere. Two of its electrons would be trapped in a slightly larger sphere. Six electrons trapped in a peanut-shaped orbital. That's teeny. Two more electrons trapped in an even larger sphere. And then finally, five electrons trapped in a bigger peanut. Right? That's the electronic structure of that chlorine atom, where all those electrons live. Okay. So, uh, as I said, it's kind of a pain in the butt. The bigger the element gets, so we have sort of an abbreviation that we can do here. All right, so here is my chlorine's electron configuration. We can represent this same thing in what we would call the noble gas abbreviation. Okay, if I looked at neon, uh, neon's electron configuration based on where it lives on the periodic table, the last element in that 2p orbital, that 2p row, its electron configuration would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. All right, notice how that matches. The ver this exactly matches the first portion of chlorine's electron configuration. So what we can do for chlorine is we can use this abbreviation where we say in bracket neon. That means insert neon's electron configuration here. Right? So chlorine has neon's electron configuration plus the 3s2, 3p6, All right? So these would both be ways to represent chlorine's electron configuration. One is the full electron configuration. The other one is utilizing this noble gas abbreviation. What's up? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, my bad. It did not gain an extra electron there. Okay, and then real quick, let's just note, right, chlorine is right here on my periodic table, right next to argon, okay? You have to use the next smallest noble gas. I had to go all the way back to helium, uh, to helium, to neon to do my noble gas abbreviation. Argon's got more electrons than chlorine. I can't use argon in my noble gas abbreviation. So it's got to be the next smallest noble gas that you use in this abbreviation. And it has to be a noble gas. You can't just pick a random element. OK? All right, cool. So uh, review of electron configurations, all well and good here. Again, the title of this chapter is the transition metals, right? So that's really the ones that we're going to be interested in here. Um, before we can kind of finish this off for these transition metals, we got to number our D block here, just like we did with our S and P block. I'm going to just do that over here. Okay. Our S, we started numbering at 1. Our P block, we started numbering at 2. For our D block, we're going to start numbering at 3. Okay, so this first row here is the 3D elements, then 4D, 5D, and 60. All right, so I want everybody to take a second and give me the electron configuration for vanadium.
All right, vanadium lives in the 3D row here, right? So my last orbital in my electron configuration is going to be 3D. And in particular, it's element one, two, three in that 3D row. So there are three electrons in that 3D orbital, okay? What comes before 3D is 4S, right? Notice that it is not in numerical order here. My 4S2 is going to come next. All right, then I'm going to go to the next one. What's in front of my 4s orbital? That's my 3p, right? Looking at element 19 and then finding element 18. So 3p6 in front of that, 3s2, 2p6, 2s2, and then finally that 1s. Okay, and again, I could have represented this same thing with my noble gas abbreviation using argon, my next smallest noble gas. That would take me all the way, right? So this here is argon's electron configuration. So vanadium would be argon plus 4s2 and 3d3. All right, cool. So we have our electron configuration for vanadium here, okay? What we're interested in when we're talking about these transition metal complexes are the ions that these transition metals form. Transition metals, like all metals, are, do a crap job of holding on to their electrons, okay? So vanadium can become the vanadium for ion. All right, if vanadium is becoming a positively charged ion, is it going to be gaining electrons or losing electrons? It's got to lose them, right? Because electrons are negatively charged. And in particular, if it's going to have a positive charge of four, then it would have to lose four electrons. All right, so we have our electron configuration for vanadium. What I want is the electron configuration for the vanadium-4 ion. All right, and remember, our electron configuration, that tells us where the electrons in a vanadium atom live. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull electrons out, off of that electron configuration. Right? I'm going to take four electrons away from this configuration here in order to get my vanadium ion. All right? So when we're going to remove electrons from our electron configuration, we're going to first remove from the outermost s orbital. All right, and if there's anything left over, then we're going to remove from the outermost d orbital. All right, so first of all, by outermost, I mean the largest, the ones that are listed at the end of our electron configuration here. These are the highest energy orbitals, the ones that are easiest to remove electrons from. We call those the valence orbitals. All right, so I'm going to first take two electrons from that outermost s orbital, my 4s electrons. All right, but then I still got two more to go because I got to lose a total of four. So I'm going to take the remaining two from that 3d orbital. All right, so I'm not going to touch those core electrons. I'll still have my 1s2, 
2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6. But now I don't have any more 4s electrons left over. I took all two of those. And I'm down to just one 3d orbital. Uh, 3d electrons, I'm sorry. All right, so we have our electron configurations for our transition metals. What we're going to see is when these form these complexes, we haven't even talked about the complexes yet, but when they do, they're going to be transition metal ions. And so we need the electron configuration for those transition metal ions. All right, so then y'all are going to do one for, from scratch for me here. I'll put up our periodic table. You're going to give me the electron configuration for the iron 3 ion. So I'm going to start by getting my electron configuration for iron, the iron atom. And then I'm going to remove electrons from that electron configuration in order to form an ion with a positive three charge. I'm going to need to take three electrons away. That would be both of my 4s electrons need to go. And then one of my 3d. So my electron configuration for the iron 3 ion is argons plus 3d5. All right. So now we're going to talk about these transition metal complexes. OK? So it turns out that if you took an iron 3 ion and you put it into a solution with a bunch of chloride ions, Those chloride ions would be attracted to that iron ion. And at first, that doesn't really sound like anything too crazy. An iron ion has a positive three charge. A chloride ion has a minus charge. Opposites attract. So yeah, like of course, they're going to be attracted to one another here. Okay, But there's something more special that occurs with these transition metals. Okay, These aren't for regular metals like sodium. These are unique to transition metals here. All right, they will actually form a complex with these chloride ions where the iron becomes covalently bound to these chlorines. And everybody's chemistry brain should have exploded just a little bit right there because we're talking about covalent bonds to a metal. That's absurd, right? We don't have covalent bonds with metals. Yes, that is exactly the new thing that we're learning here. These transition metals, in particular, can form covalent bonds. And we have a special name for them. These are what are called coordinate covalent bonds. All right, so these complexes, they still follow our normal rules of charge conservation here. 
So if I have one chloride ion with a positive three charge, I'm sorry, one iron ion with a positive three charge, and six chloride ions, each with a negative one charge, my complex is going to have an overall net charge of minus three. All right, plus three minus six gives me my net charge of negative three. We put a little box around our ion with the charge in the corner. Okay, so some more terminology here. We have our iron ion in the middle, our transition metal ion, okay? The charge on that transition metal ion is what we call the oxidation state. All right, notice that the oxidation state does not necessarily match the net charge of my complex, okay? It's the charge specifically on that transition metal ion, okay, that forms the complex, okay? That's our oxidation state. The things on the outside, the things that decorate those transition metals, in this case our chlorines, our chlorides, these are what are called ligands. All right, I'm going to show you here in a second. We have a table of our ligands for this particular chapter, the uh, things that can form ligands as tra with transition metals. Like we said, those covalent bonds are called coordinate covalent bonds. Okay, This whole thing together, my ligands plus my transition metals, all covalently bound with those coordinate covalent bonds, is what we call the complex. Right? Or we can be more specific, in this case it's a complex ion. But when we're talking about transition metal complexes, this is that thing. Right? The ligands covalently bound to our transition metal ion. That is a complex. That's what we're going to be studying in this chapter. All right, so in this case, my ligand were these negatively charged chloride ions, okay? So let's first do a problem. I'm going to give you a formula for a coordination complex. I guess I can say I can summarize my complex ion here in just kind of one molecular formula. Right, so that thing that I've drawn out the structure for, we can summarize as FeCl6 with a negative three charge. That's the charge of the complex. All right, so what can I ask you here? I can ask you something like, what is the oxidation state of cobalt? in this complex ion here. So I got a cobalt. It's got four chlorides around it. I'm trying to figure out what the oxidation state of that cobalt is. If the overall charge of my complex that forms is minus two. All right, so my cobalt charge plus four times the chlorine charge is going to equal my net charge. I know my chlorine charge is minus one, 
right? So what minus 4 is going to leave me with negative 2? I believe in y'all. We can do this kind of math here. All right, yeah, positive 2. So my oxidation state of my cobalt would be that char, right? That's what we call that charge, plus 2. It's plus 4 times the charge on the chlorine, and each charge is negative 1. So 4 times negative 1 is negative 4. OK, so chlorine is an example of a charged ligand. There are also ligands that don't have a charge associated with them. So for example, iron can form a complex with just water. Okay, water would be an example of a neutral ligand. So if this overall complex had a charge of three, what is the oxidation state of the iron? If each of those waters are neutral and my overall complex is positive three, what's that iron ion gotta be? Positive three. I wasn't very creative picking the exact same example we did before, but yes. All right, so this would be an iron three ion. So my oxidation number is three. Okay, and like I said, I'm gonna show you this list of ligands here in a second. But one more thing that we want to note about our ligands here is that some ligands, so for example, ethylene diamine, which has this structure where it's got an NH2 group on both sides. This can form a complex with, for example, our iron 3 ion. All right, when this thing forms a complex here, we get these coordinate covalent bonds, but it can actually form two coordinate covalent bonds with either one of these ethylene diamine ligands. Okay, so if I were gonna were to draw my complex here, it's actually bound at two locations. All right, that com that ligand can form two coordinate covalent bonds with that transition metal. Okay, so this would be an example of what we call a bi-dentate ligand. Bi meaning that it can bind in two places. I have no idea where the word dentate comes from. Sounds like a dentist's office term, but that is what we call something that can bind in two places. Our water and our chlorine, these would be examples of monodentate ligands, right? One binding site. They can form one coordinate covalent bond with their transition metal ions. Cool. All right. So, like I said, we got a list of these different ligands. So let's take a look at our constants page for this chapter. All right, here are our list of ligands. Okay, for each ligand we have the formula for our ligand. Okay, importantly, this includes the charge 
Again, some of them are charged. Other ones don't have anything written there, meaning that they're neutral. Okay? That's important for calculating your oxidation state of your transition metal ion, Keep uh, accounting for that charge. We have the name of those ligands. So those chloride ions, when they become ligands, we call them chloro groups. All right, and then lastly, we have the number of donor atoms here. So for example, these that have two, these are these bidentate ligands. All right, combined at two locations. Uh, these ones that we have with just one donor atom, these would be our monodentate ligands. And we even got EDTA here, which has six donor sites here. So this would be a hexadentate ligand. All right? So the dentate just tells you how many binding sites it has, how many donor atoms it has, right? Corresponding to how many of those coordinate covalent bonds it can form. Polydentate would cover everything more than one. So yes, that would be true. It's, it's a more of a blanket term, though. All right. So now we get to do something really fun, which is learn how to name these complexes. Uh, let's start out with a neutral ligand, actually. I think it'll be a little bit easier. All right, this thing right here has a special name, and we get to learn how to name it. All right, so I'm going to tell you the name of these at first, and then we're going to learn how to build them ourselves. All right, so you're just going to trust me at first. We're going to pick apart that name, see how it matches the formula, and then we'll work on building them ourselves. All right, so this one right here is a hexa aqua cobalt three complex rolls off the tongue. All right, so let's pick this apart here. The hexa corresponds to the number of ligands that I have. The aqua corresponds to the name of that ligand. Water, when it's a ligand, we call it aqua. All right, so in my formula here, I had six waters, so that's why I have a hexa aqua. All right, so the number of ligands plus the ligand name. This is cobalt because that's my transition metal. And then lastly, the three in the name corresponds to the oxidation number of that metal. In this case, because uh, water is a neutral ligand, it matches my charge of my complex. But remember, that's not always the case. All right. So in your name is specifically not the charge of the complex, but the oxidation state of your transition metal. All right, so these prefixes, we have another part of our constants page here, All right? Six ligands was hexa. Depending on the number that we have, we're going to use a different prefix, okay? And again, this is our constants page, so this is what we have to work with here. This isn't something you have to memorize. This is a tool you need to know how to use, okay? You will notice that we have different ones for our polydentate ligands. We'll get to that here in a second. We're going to stick first with just our simpler monodentate ligands. All right, so given this here, 
Oh. I want you all to tell me what the name of an FeCl4 minus 2 complex would, oh, no, 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 I lied. We can't do that. Sorry. Uh, plus 1 complex would be. What's up? Correct. This is on our constants page for this particular chapter. So this is what you can expect to have on your exam. Again, it's not something you have to have memorized. It's a tool you need to know how to use. Yep. All right. So I got four of those ligands. So this would be a tetra. Those ligands are chlorine, so they are chloro ligands. Tetra, chloro. My transition metal is iron. All right, and then my oxidation number is not the net charge of that complex, but the charge on the iron ion which would have to be 5. All right? My overall char my iron plus my four chlorines has to equal plus 1. Each chlorine is negative 1, so iron minus 4 equals plus 1. That means that my iron is plus 5. Right? Again, it's not the charge of the complex in the name, it's the oxidation number. So if you have a charged ligand, you're going to have to do a little math to figure out what your oxidation number is. So I guess I lied to you. There is a little bit of math in this chapter. All right, so then one more before I complicate things. Uh, just keeping that in mind, name this one for me. CR is chromium. Let's do CN3. All right, so this would be tri cyano chromium. And what's my oxidation number on this complex? Five. All right, so again, the number of ligands, the name of the ligand, the transition metal. And then finally, the oxidation number.
All right, so now let's do one with our polydentate ligands. Okay, so what about something like N I E N two plus two? For our polydentate ligands, anything with a number of donor atoms greater than one, we got to use this set of prefixes here. So instead of using di, I'm going to use bis. I don't make the rules, all right? I have no idea what the logic behind this is. All right? So this is now bis. Notice our en is that ethylene diamine. Okay? And for whatever reason, with your polydentate ligands, you got to use your special prefixes here, and the name of that ligand goes in parentheses. So this is now in parentheses, ethylene diamine. Let me try to make some room here. All right, and then the last part is the same. So now we're going to follow this up. We got our number of ligands. We got the name of our ligand. We're going to do our metal. I never remember if it's L-E or E-L. I think it's E-L. All right, and then because ethylene diamine is a neutral ligand, here my oxidation state will just be the same as my charge, right? Because that ethylene diamine ligand doesn't contribute. So, bis ethylene diamine nickel 2. Okay. So, let's just sort of make a note in our notes here for this example with the polydentate ligands. We got to use the polydentate prefixes. And our name goes in parentheses. All right, so up until now, I've been doing all positively charged complexes. So now let's look at one that has a negative charge, like COCl4 minus 2. All right, in order to name this, we got to use our th the last section of our chart here. Okay, so we're going to start this off pretty similarly. How many chloros do I have? What prefix am I going to use? Tetra. Those are chlorines, so they are chloro groups, chloro ligands. Okay? The difference is now going to come in how, do I, re in how I refer to my metal ion. Because my complex is negatively charged, I'm going to have to use the anion name for that metal. Okay, previously we were just calling it cobalt or chromium or iron or nickel, right? Those are what we do for positively charged complexes. For negatively charged complexes, we have to refer to this as the cobaltate ion, cobaltate ion. So tetrachloro. Cobalt, Tate, okay. 
Okay, and then we're still going to need to put our oxidation number in there. Everybody take a second and figure out what the oxidation number is on cobalt in this complex. Okay, so the cobalt minus 4 gives me negative 2. So what's my cobalt going to be? Positive 2. Your transition metals, the metals themselves, will always have positive oxidation numbers, right? Metals will lose electrons. Your complex, when it binds to those ligands, can be positive or negative charged, but the transition metal itself will always have a positive charge, positive oxidation state. All right, so then one last curveball to throw at y'all here. Let's say that we have copper, and it forms a complex with some ammonia and some chloride here. Okay, and I'll even say the oxidation number of our, um, well, let's do plus one. It's plus one, meaning our overall complex has a charge of minus one. All right, so. When we build our formula and our name for these complexes here, now I have multiple ligands to worry about, right? I have both a chloro ligand and an ammonia or what we call an amine ligand, all right? When we put our formulas and our names together, how are we going to organize this? We're going to put it in good old alphabetical order. Okay, so our ligand, our amine ligand, is going to come before our chloro ligand. All right, so when I'm building my formula for this here, it would be Cu, and then our amine, I got two of them, because that comes first in alphabetical order, followed by my chloro ligand, and then that net charge of negative one. All right, and when we name them, we're just going to read them in that alphabetical order as well. All right, um, let me just point out real quick because we're looking at this formula here. The amine, the ammonia, is in parentheses, right? That's because there's both nitrogens and hydrogens in there. They're a package deal as a ligand. For my monatomic ligands, I don't have to worry about parentheses. There's just that one chlorine atom in there, so that one's not in parentheses, right? So anything containing more than one atom, any, any ligand containing more than one atom, you would put in, your, in parentheses in your name. Uh, for the halogens, they're just single atoms, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, so then just to finish this off, let's take this to our constants page so we can see everything. Go ahead and give me the name of this complex here.
All right, so there are two NH3 groups, what we refer to, what we refer to as amines. All right, so in my name, I'm going to start out with diamine. And then I also have two chloro groups, right? We call those chlorines chloro groups. So I'm just going to tack that on there, dichloro. Um, what's going to be the name of my transition metal here? I got to use the anion name, right? Because this is a negatively charged complex. So this wouldn't just be copper, but a cuprate. All right, and then my overall charge of my complex is minus one. Notice that my amines are neutral, so they're not going to contribute to the charge. But those chloro groups have a minus one charge, and I have two of them. So that means that my copper ion has to have a charge of plus one, an oxidation state of one. So diamine, dichloro, cuprate, one. What's up? The charge? Yeah. So I'm trying to figure out my copper, right? I got two of those NH3s and two of those chlorines. Everything's got to sum up to negative one. That's the net charge on my complex. Okay. I don't know what my copper is. But I know that my amine has a charge of zero. So that's not going to factor into this calculation at all. And then my chloro groups each have a charge of minus one. So I got to figure out what minus two leaves me with negative one. And the answer would be positive one. Okay, so just two sort of things to note about our last examples here. All right, for negatively charged complexes, we have to use the anion name for our transition metal. Right? So since we had this negatively charged ion, we didn't refer to this as a cobalt, but as a cobaltate complex. Right? So negatively charged complexes, we're going to use the anion name of our transition metal. And then lastly, if we have multiple ligands, we're going to arrange in alphabetical order. All right, so kind of all over the map here on this, but let's just go back here to the basics. Our name of our complexes always have the same structure, number of ligands, ligand name, your transition metal, and then finally the oxidation number. Okay, And then we got some levels of complication here for our polydentate ligands. We got to use our polydentate ligand prefixes, and we got to put the name of that ligand in parentheses. If our complex is negatively charged, we're going to have to use the anion name from our, for our transition metals, not the metal name. And then lastly, if we have multiple ligands, we're going to arrange them in our name in alphabetical order. Right? So amine came before chloro. That's how I organized my name. Cool. So look, these things, diamine, dicuprate, dichlorocuprate one, it's like, oh my gosh, what the hell? Right? It's like a process, a set of rules that you got to apply in order to build that name. 
right? There's no memorization. It's not something that you look at and you just kind of know. You pull it together from your constant page. You build that name based on these charts here. Cool? All right. Have a good week.